Welcome once again. Now, Wednesday evening saw the release of the final tranche of the state capture reporters. You can well imagine South Africans are grappling uh, in turn as to what to make uh, of all this content. Dr. Neva Machetla is a senior economist at the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. Tips. She wrote an article titled Corruption is Not the Glitch, It's the Setting. She joins us now via Zoom. A very good day to you, Dr. Machetla. Thank you so much for making the time. Good morning. I cite the article, but you've written numerous articles on the scourge of uh, corruption and that it continues unabated in spite of multiple efforts. Why do you say it's not the glitch, but the setting? Because I think the, the concern is that if you see it as a glitch, you go after evil individuals when in fact there are systemic factors that mean corruption will persist until we change some of these systemic issues. And they actually operate at two levels. One is in terms of how we control discretion um, around resource use. But the other one is just a, a very unequal and exclusionary economy, especially the private sector, which means if the state doesn't intervene, then um, people will use the state illegitimately. So you speak about the state of the economy in a time such as this, where South Africans are struggling to make a living, they don't have jobs. What does this report mean to them? You know, I think the, the report means to all of us that we came very close to losing our democracy. And I think that's something we should reflect on, that state capture is not the same as, you know, ordinary corruption because it actually changes power at the top of the state. And it takes power out of the hands of the voters and puts it into the power of people who can buy you know, influence at the very highest levels of the government. So I think that's a, that's a very particular kind of corruption. Um, but the, the, the issue of how we deal with corruption generally we have to think about what are those systems in government that permit it to persist. But we also have to think about how do we come up with a more equitable and inclusive economy so that people feel they can get ahead through legitimate means. And that, you know, for many people feel like the only way to get, a, to get ahead is to get a state contract or to somehow have support from the state. But we need a state program that will enable people to get ahead and overcome the apartheid legacy of profound inequalities. Um, without having to turn to corruption. So without excusing corruption, I think we have to say, what are the, what's the environment in the economy that means people fall back on corruption because they feel that's their only chance? Is the Chief Justice uh, Zondo correct to say President Sarah Ramaphosa's position gave him enough power and responsibility to do something about the rot? Yeah, I think that, I think that what... Zondo said was that people who were in government who thought they were maybe able to control it um, within the state, you know, quietly and just deal with it quietly, that they maybe underestimated the importance of being open about it and overestimated their ability to control it uh, without public support. Because one of the key things, one of the key systemic factors that enables corruption is secrecy. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's worth noting that what really helped with the state capture stuff was the role of the media and the public and civil society organizations that mobilize. And we need more of that kind of transparency. And we need to talk about how do we ensure that government decisions are more transparent. So for instance, even today, tender decisions tend to be very secret. And the argument is you have to protect the bidders. But what it means is we as the public never actually know why one bidder was chosen over the other. That clearly opens the door to corruption. So does the president have to wait until October to take the report to parliament? What happens in the interim with some of the individuals in parliament who are implicated in the report? I think, you know, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but the fact of the matter, I'm an economist. Um, the fact of the matter is, however, that um, the legal system is very slow and overburdened. And one of the things I was looking at in that article was that we have a legal system that was designed for a high-income country. And we, in some ways, we just can't afford it. We really need to say, how do we come up with other kinds of dispute settlement where possible so that these big cases 
we actually have the resources to focus on them and get them to move faster. I think the lawyers tend to see it as the delay is inevitable, and but sometimes that delay in fixing these problems and addressing these problems is a very high cost, not just because corruption can sometimes continue as it did before, um, before the state capture, um, before the change of government and the state capture commission itself, but just because it undermines the public trust that things will ever happen. So. I think the prosecutions are coming, but when they're delayed for years, that really does undermine public trust in the system. Yeah. On the one hand, you have individuals. But our, let me just say, but yeah. I, I was, that's the point. Our legal system is riddled with delays. And so the issues about when you go to parliament, all of those things are built into the system. We need to say, can we come up with a system that requires those resources so we can speed things up? That. I, I think for me it refers to the question I was asking about what South Africans should do with this because that process you just suggest could also have issues of uh, just how long it takes. But I was want to, wanting to say on the one hand you have individuals who are implicated. On the other hand you have public institutions. Between the two will we see the end of corruption in South Africa and how should the ANC be responding to the state capture report? Well, you know, I would love to see the ANC respond by saying, you know, even a whiff of suspicion, if it's well founded, for instance, if the commission thinks it's sound, should lead to rigorous and immediate action, obviously. I think we would all like to see that. In terms of government institutions, I think that really we need to say, rather than just looking at these individual cases, they need to look at their systems, as does the private sector and service providers like you know, accounting agencies and lawyers and banks that enable this kind of corruption. And we need to say, what can we do to ensure that it doesn't happen again? Where were the systemic failures that enabled this? And that continue to enable it. Critical one is excessive secrecy. Critical one is also um, the failure. It's not just whistleblowers. It's if you are a public servant, and we've all seen this, well, if you've been in government, you've seen this happen. You're a public servant and you try and prevent something corrupt. Sometimes it's possible that they just take your powers away. Or you can be dismissed if you're in an SOC and the board doesn't really have to lay out very clearly what are the reasons and let you give your side of the story. So some of those protections, not just for whistleblowers, but for people who are just doing their job to prevent corruption. I mean, I know many public servants who simply refuse to hand over the money as it were. Some of them, you know, they didn't always use their jobs, but sometimes those powers were then allocated to someone else. That kind of thing, we need to be clear about how we, stand, how we stop it. But even more, we as the public, but also within government, the, the audit systems need to focus much more on outcomes. So if you look at some of these things like, you know, the dairy farm, farm in the free state, um, some of what was going on at ESCOM, if there had been clear outcome indicators that said, what has to happen, and the audit had been against those outcome indicators, that corruption would have been caught much sooner. Yeah. Dr. Bachetla, just in wrapping up, what is the significance of the process, the completion, and the release of the very complex Zondo report for South Africa's efforts at building this developmental country? Okay. I think that what's important is that um, it forces us to look in the mirror and say, what do we have to change? And not just blame it on a few individuals, but on what is it about our economic system and our governance systems that allowed this to happen? And I think it's, it's particularly to say, you know, the kinds of inequality and oppression that arises in the private sector, it's not always illegal, that's the problem. It's that it's built into a highly unequal economy. And if we don't fix that, we're not going to be able to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. So I would hope that, you know, really people should read the Zondo report or at least read the news reporting on the Zondo report and think about how, what can they do as citizens um, to mobilize to prevent this from happening, including through taking an interest in how government functions and trying to ensure they demand that it function better and in the interest of the majority. Because that's after all why we fought for democracy.
And with that, we're going to thank you for joining us this morning. I would have loved to engage more with you as an economist about the latest numbers that have come through that inflation is <laughs> just uh, running wild in South Africa with the chances that prices will be going even uh, higher uh, for uh, a really stressed South African population. But that's, of course, a conversation for another day. Thank you so much for your time.